Hello, my name is Kevin Kelly, and I'm the co-chair of the Long Now Foundation. For 25 years, Long Now has been promoting long-term thinking. And we asked ourselves, who might know about how to think long-term? And we looked around and realized that some of the longest-lived companies and other institutions on this planet may have something to say about thinking long-term. Alexander Rose, the executive director of the Long Now, was employee number one. And for 25 years, Alexander has been thinking about this question. Recently, Alexander launched the Organizational Continuity Project to investigate this premise in a systematic way. Even though the project has just launched and we're just beginning, already the question is really productive and is prompting new insights. This evening, Alexander will report on the genesis of that project, its framework, and what we might expect in the future. I think this is a very exciting work, and at the core of the Long Now Foundation's own premise to foster long-term thinking. I look forward to it, and I really welcome Alexander. Hello. I'm Alexander Rose, the executive director here at the Long Now Foundation. And today I'm gonna to be talking to you about a new research project that we've been working on called the Organizational Continuity Project. And the goal is really to start to understand uh, some of the reasons behind the longest lived organizations in terms of how they've lasted, why they've lasted, and if there's any portable lessons that we might learn as an institution that ourselves wants to become a multi-century, multi-millennial, organization. The Long Now Foundation was started almost 25 years ago, really to be the seed of a very long-term institution that could survive alongside some of our more iconic projects, like the 10,000-year clock that's currently under construction, or our language projects like the Rosetta Disk. And each of these projects will have a hopefully a multi-thousand-year component. And we want an institution that can both help contextualize that in civilization as well as maintain it, and really help maintain the information and knowledge of civilization as it moves through centuries and millennia. So in order to create that institution, we realized there really aren't kind of bodies of knowledge of creating multi-generational institutions, but there are many of them out in the world that we can learn from. So this project is hopefully us learning about how to become one of the longest term institutions ourselves. And what you're seeing here in this presentation is the beginning of that research where we're starting to learn about some of these oldest organizations and some of the reasons that they've, uh, that they've been able to last. It's an interesting question of why does organizational continuity matter? The thing that we keep coming to is that we as society discover things that are that are really important information and stories about how to better survive something like a natural disaster. And I think an interesting example in recent times was the earthquake that started a what's now considered to be about once in century event of a major tsunami there back in 2011. And when those stories of that tsunami, the tragic story of those tsunamis was going around, this one really caught my eye. And it was a story of these tablets and markers that were found throughout Japan, some as old as 500 years old or, or more, reading things like, high dwellings are the peace and harmony of our descendants. Remember the calamity of the great tsunamis. Do not build homes below this point. And tragically, many homes were built below this point. Many homes and, and property damage and lives were lost and you know the Fukushima nuclear plant damaged. Um, all of these things because they weren't listening and didn't have the organizational continuity, even in a country that is famous for some of the best organizational continuity and maintenance in the world, such as Japan. And, you know, we're now living through one of the great examples of um, why organizational continuity might matter. It's a, you know, this global pandemic that was 100 percent predicted and known event was going to happen. We have within our, our own written history, many indications of it. We even had institutions that tried to prepare for this, but actually the governments didn't listen to those. And now we have this tragic response to, you know, an event that really could have been solved better by having better organizational continuity. So this, this problem is not an esoteric one. It's, a, it's one that, that really has real world consequences. And, you know, we don't want to find ourselves, you know, just a generation from now or, you know, 10 years from now, 
looking at, you know, down the barrel of something like an asteroid impact, again, a 100% predictable event that we know is going to cause loss of life, um, damage to, the, to infrastructure, um, could cause a total extinction level event, where for the first time, we're a spacefaring species that can both predict these events and stop them, but only if we're well prepared and we have the organizational continuity within our governments, our private institutions, and our science community in order to solve these types of of large problems. So what are some of the world's oldest institutions? One of the oldest companies that we know of is a temple construction company called Kongo Gumi, which was started at the end of the sixth century at least, and is still operating today. Now I believe it's been subsumed by a larger construction conglomerate, but they're still building temples and still largely the same you know, kind of operations and staff. One of the oldest hotels in the world, also in Japan, the Nishiyama Onsen Keunkan, kind of a Japanese homestay, still in operation today. One of the oldest restaurants in the world, uh, built in a little after 800 AD uh, is the Stiftskeller St. Peter uh, Hotel and Restaurant. One of the oldest wineries that we know of in the world, interestingly, is the Staffelterhof Winery in Germany, built in 862, as far as we know. Some of the other types of businesses and operations that we start to see over a millennia ago um, that are still in operation are bars and pubs. So Sean's Bar in Ireland is said to have been built in 900 AD. The other thing that we start to see in the 11th century is the invention and proliferation of universities. So we have things like the University of Bologna, and uh, soon afterwards, the University of Oxford, and then many of the other universities in, in the UK and other parts of Europe really start to proliferate. More recently, we are, are seeing some more commodity type things like the Poland salt mines in Weliska, starting in the 13th century, and then even paper companies like the Storienzo uh, Finnish Paper Company in 1288. But you'll notice that not only are many of the oldest organizations in the world in certain areas like Japan and, and old world Europe, um, but also they tend to be a ton of breweries, winemakers, uh, confectionaries, in some cases, hotels, organizations that serve basic human needs. One of the other things that you start to see when you look at uh, aggregates of companies that, for instance, last for more than 200 years, a huge majority are in Japan. So this idea that location matters, even though Japan has risen and fallen and had lost wars, They've, their basic system of government and culture has lasted over time. And, and the other places like Old World Europe and Germany and Holland and France are some of the other places that we see some of the longest lived institutions. And so the other thing that you start to see is that 90% of the companies that are over 200 years old also have less than 300 employees. Now, if you look at more modern companies like the Fortune 500 companies, uh, another very interesting thing starts to appear. One is that they're kind of financial service companies. There's kind of universal services that people have needed over the past few centuries. But if you also look at how long companies are lasting on the Fortune 500 list, it used to be in 1950 that all the companies on the Fortune 500 list averaged at about 61 years old. If you look at that data now, that's actually less than 18 years that these companies are surviving. So these are not mega companies. They're not the largest companies or organizations in the world. They're the ones that have figured out a niche and a market size and a size of their company that can last over centuries at a time. The thing that comes out of this data, if your only goal is growth, especially as a company, it's very difficult for you to last for a long time. You kind of outgrow all of your resources and all of your customers. Of the thousand companies that we know of that are over 300 years old, as I mentioned, there's a huge section of this is in the alcohol industry by a lot, um, the hotel industry and restaurant and food, food service industry, all of which are kind of, in a way, kind of the same market. Um, and then as you get down into this, you start to find things like pharmaceutical companies, financial companies. You also find things like libraries and universities. So I think libraries are very interesting because they are the place where civilization stores its information to help it understand problems of the past, solutions for the future, and they are the memory institution of our cultures. And if you look at some of the oldest libraries in the world that are no longer in operation, they're all largely in the Middle East. But because of the historical turns of the world, we lost many of those cities and libraries. And those libraries go back as far as, uh, you know, 
almost 4,500 years in some cases. You look at the libraries that are still in operation and that, that whole center has moved to Europe. And that's because the organizational continuity within Europe survived a lot of those wars. And so we still have that information. We're able to, um, we're able to, to um, access it. We tend to have those languages more than we have the languages of those ancient libraries. Some of the other oldest institutions that we have in the world are universities, um, the oldest of which, or at least one of the oldest is the University at Bologna, Italy. It uh, was started in the 11th century. I think what's interesting about these is that they have this property of a new influx of students every single year. And that cycle of students, this brings new energy into the institution, but it also means that that institution has to make itself relevant to a different set of people every single year. So the, you know, the, the universities that have lasted have done a very good job of this. Their commodity is this universal one of education, but the way that they do it has to be remarketed to every single year of student that they have. That's helped them last for a long time, but it's also helped remind the institution why it matters why it's relevant. What are some of the other ways that things have lasted for a very long time? One is to, uh, is to have taken a very long time to have been built. Um, and we've mentioned religion before here as one of the longest lasting institutions in the world, but one of their structures that they create are cathedrals. Uh, and cathedrals have this interesting property is that many of them took decades, if not centuries, to, to build. And you know, one of the oldest ones, the cathedral at Cologne, uh, Germany, was started in 1248. It took 600 years to build this cathedral. The most dangerous time you find is for something to last is really just a generation or two after it was first built or founded. And that's because you know, it's the institution or the, the cathedral of your of the last generation, and it's no longer in fashion. Often people find you know, a different use for that, that property. Um, but if you take, let's say, 600 years to build it, by the time you're done, it already has a different type of value to civilization. It's a thing that has value for its antiquity and its cultural uh, kind of knowledge um, and relevance. And you know, we see this now with even modern cathedrals that aren't even done. So the, the Sagrada Familia Cathedral in Barcelona um, was begun in 1882. We're now almost 140 years into its construction progress, and it's not done. But it's already a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and there's probably few examples of this in the world. But if it lasts long enough, even in its build process, it can become valuable to, to a civilization, and that civilization can then help it last. In fact, the, the tickets that get sold to come into this thing are the, really the way that it's being funded to get completed. In Japan, we also find things like the oldest continuously standing wooden structures. These temples at Nara, Japan, were started in 607 AD, and they have survived all kinds of um, influxes of government and other societies and even other religions to this day, really because of slow, careful maintenance. The roofs were kept intact. Um, the main timbers are still the main timbers, but they've replaced little bits and pieces of the outsides over time, and they've allowed them to last. And they, in turn, have helped the institution last over the same kind of time frame. Another example, only a couple hours away by train, um, but d a very different strategy are the, um, the Issei shrines in Japan. And these uh, date back almost two millennia ago. And these temples are built in, a, in an interesting way that they're not built out of very long lasting materials, then they're not necessarily themselves maintained from year to year, but they're rebuilt um, in exact copies of each other in alternating sites. And so you can see an image of these temples every 20 years where the old one is now being deconstructed and the new one is being constructed. I was lucky enough to be there about eight years ago for the rebuilding of the last temple when the, the now princess of Japan moves the, the kind of cultural treasures from one to the the next. And so you have the master builders who are in their 80s. The last cycle of this 20 years ago when they were in their 50s or 60s, they were the mid-level master builders. And then you have people in their 20s and 30s who are the new builders, all of them learning how to rebuild this temple. And in turn, I think helping that cultural institution last itself by reminding that cultural institution of the reasons it exists and all of the rites and rituals that go along with that.
If we get out of the institution category and look for some examples in other areas, we start to see communities of practice, for instance. We have evidence of martial arts being documented back as far as 5,000 years. And that these communities of practice are not necessarily formal organizations, but they do have a storytelling tradition, again, from master to apprentice, that has kept that information around for a very long period of time. So one of the things that you have to look at if you're trying to build an institution or organization that's going to last for hundreds or even thousands of years is really some of the larger demographic trends. And I think often when we look at things like population growth, which are you know, closely tied in a lot of ways to how, you know, kind of growth economics and how institutions are judged on growth, is that you know, when you look at just the next 30 or 40 years, you have this, you know, asymptotic kind of hockey stick graph going off into trillions of people, which, you know, obviously this world isn't going to support. And we're going to have uh, limiting factors of resources and things like that that are going to start to bring population down. In fact, when you look at some of the projections around population, they all start coming down around the next 50 years. And, you know, in nature, we see this all the time where you have a top level predator, their population goes up as their amount of prey goes up and then as they eat eat those resources, then the, the predator population falls along with the prey population. And so we're clearly going to be going through some cycles like this. So how can we build new institutions and organizations that are just as good at living in a world of less people in markets that are smaller and really be able to shrink but not totally die off? And so when you look at these small hotels or breweries, um, or even smaller commodity companies, the ones that are going to survive and that have already survived, survived famines and uh, volcanic eruptions and huge changes in market and wars and, and, and all of these things, they've all found a way to survive those. And I think one of the things that I really want to do is start to understand each of those um, so that some of those may be you know, not very portable lessons, but I'm hoping that many of them are portable lessons that we can look at for creating new institutions that can last for a very long time. What's also important is to kind of understand culture and value systems. Um, we don't want every institution in the world to last for a long time. There are bad things that can be perpetuated. We've had, you know, empires that have been, you know, horribly oppressive that have lasted for a long time. In the last century, we had um, we had Hitler and the Nazi Reich, who, you know, Hitler literally intended to set up a thousand year Reich. And I think we're all glad that these institutions <laughs> did not last. It's always worth thinking about the values, what institutions should last. Some are, you know, some companies and institutions should be fast churn and we should learn a little bit from them and they should be replaced by ones that are that are more important for us. Um, and it's very important to kind of think about that as we're trying to think about how to build some of the longest lived institutions. So in nature, we have some examples of ways that that organisms last for uh, very long periods of time. There's clonal species such as the manzanita bushes or aspen tree groves. These are species where the individuals themselves die out, but their, their DNA is replicated through root structures of them being continuously reborn. And these can slowly adapt to things like climate and move up a hillside or down a hillside to help its climate so they're not fixed to a very specific location but have a chance to kind of move around a little bit and respond to climate and change and also if you know an animal or a human cuts down one of them they have this chance to live on as at least their kind of basic DNA programming code. And these can last for longer than 10,000 years. I think they have some of these that they suspect are over 40,000 years old. And the last example is one of my favorites. It's a single individual organism that can last for as long as 5,000 years. And it's the bristlecone pine. And these trees are found in some of the highest mountains here in North America. And what's interesting to me about these is that they, the idea of them was postulated before they were discovered. So as people started to core some of the oldest trees in the world, they found that the ones in the worst environments were the longest lived ones. And in fact, when they went into the White Mountains and then the Snake Range in Nevada and California, they cored these trees that are, live well above normal tree line and found that some of these individuals last as long as 5,000 years. So by living in an adverse environment, they have a really kind of high immune response to change. 
So one of the things that does keep coming up in my research uh, is that there seems to be often in some of these oldest companies and organizations, um, a person who tells the stories and connects the generation to generation within companies and organizations. In some places that's, that's highly cultivated like the temples in Japan, but in some places it's very informal. And, and sometimes it's a, you know, it's a parent of a founder or um, even you know, in some cases like a janitor who's, who's been there for decades and tells the stories of how certain things survived in the past and sometimes they're the person that you know remembers the last plague or the last war and can remind current management uh, what what they did during that time in order to weather it. Or if the management is, let's say, proposing a new project, this person might remind them, oh, you know what, we tried that and it really didn't work. And maybe it could work now with new tools in a new time, but here's why it didn't work then. And so many of these institutions kind of have this have this person, and um, I think one of the places that I found that it's interestingly, um, you know, very formalized is in some of the cathedrals in Europe, like Salisbury Cathedral, which has been around uh, for all, over 800 years, and they have a person there whose title is called the Keeper of the Fabric, which is kind of my favorite title for these uh, type of people. They have, you know, roles of keeping track of the finances and and basic administrative tasks, but they also have this role of really kind of bridging generational conversations. And in fact, I think what's interesting about the Salisbury Cathedral is that the oldest continuously operating clock is the tower clock that's in that cathedral. And that keeper of the fabrics, their job, one of their jobs is to, to help make sure these things are maintained between some of the wars and difficult financial times or technical failures that it has to recover from. We might imagine how keepers of the fabric could be cultivated in the institutions that we have in the world to help them last. These keepers of the fabric can, in some cases, mean the difference between life and death. An amazing counterexample to the very first one I started this talk with are the Sentinelese tribes of the Andaman Islands in the uh, Indian Ocean. And these tribes are, are, are small, a few thousand people, but they have had these kind of keepers of the fabric to tell uh, oral traditional stories over as many as I think what we now know to be about 60,000 years. Their island was heavily affected by the 2004 tsunami um, off the coast of Indonesia that wiped out you know, huge chunks of modern culture. And when the anthropologist arrived at this largely uh, fishing uh, kind of sustenance village, assuming that it was gonna be wiped out in these islands, they found them totally intact. And they asked them, you know, what, how did you survive this tsunami? And they said, you know, this is a tribe that's, that's been on these islands for over 60,000 years, an African diaspora tribe for 60,000 years. And they have a, a, a totally oral storytelling tradition that's helped along by shamans and chiefs and, and storytellers within their communities that said when the, when, the, when the water recedes, just like it does in a normal wave cycle, that it's always gonna come back and eat at least an equal amount. And so when they saw the water receding during the, the beginning, the antecedent to the last tsunami, they ran for the hills. Whereas you saw people in modern day Bangladesh and Indonesia standing on the beach with cell phones, filming the water going out, not thinking that it was gonna have this reciprocal effect. Um, so it was this very old knowledge, these keepers of the fabric that helped save life, save property, save and save culture um, over time. And I think the question is, you know, who are the keepers of our fabric? Um, I think, you know, private organizations and religions, interestingly, kind of have these um, more than others. Um, I think, you know, a lot of our cultural institutions like libraries um, and museums are kind of hit and miss on this. Um, governments generally are pretty bad at this, but we can imagine that, you know, we certainly want government data like birth and death records, um, government data from you know the World Health Organization from this pandemic to the next we want that information to survive um, I think a, a, the last example I'll give is is of a, of a of a good example and a story of kind of a hero of the keeper of the fabric um, who was unappreciated in his time in another city in Japan and it was a mayor it was a 10 term mayor uh, in this city um, who's, who was dead long before the last big tsunami. And he actually, he pulled together government resources and funding to build this, you know, actually fairly ugly, massive 51 foot seawall 
pretty high in a city that's pretty far away from, from the ocean, much further away than other ones were. And he was ridiculed and told that, you know, that this was a waste of money and that it didn't look good. Um, and this, this seawall was closed just in time to save the city from the last uh, from the last tsunami, well, as cities all around it who had only built, you know, uh, seawalls that were 30 feet tall um, were wiped out. In fact, the seawalls basically helped keep the water in once the, once the water came over them. And it was because this mayor had, a, had cultural memory from tell, the stories that were told to him by his elders, and he kept it relevant. He had enough power within government and respect um, and length in government to build something that nobody else would ever have the kind of uh, cultural power um, and social power and economic power to do. Um, so we can all, I think, take these examples and um, try and figure out what institutions we want to last for a long time, what is the type of information that we want to last for a long time, and who are we going to have within these institutions and how are we going to empower them to be the keepers of the fabric to make sure that we survive the, the kind of the difficulties of the calamities that we might live through, and more than that, really thrive and have, an, have a civilization that can last in the next 10,000 years, hopefully better than we have in the last 10,000 years. So with that, uh, thank you so much. Um, again, this is the beginning of research in this area. I hope to come back and uh, report back, uh, especially as I start talking to many more individuals in these institutions about uh, how, what else I'm learning, uh, the much more portable lessons uh, of these institutions and how they might help the institutions that are important to us going forward. So thank you so much for having me.